it's, it's best thought of as digital gold. So it's gold is, as people have said, a store of value for 5,000 years. Right. And gold is what people typically fled to when the governments tried to, uh, you know, inflate them out. And in the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt confiscated everybody's gold in 1933. You had to turn it in or you went to jail. So they can't confiscate your Bitcoin because there's nothing, they, if you hold it securely, if, as long as you have an internet connection, you can, you can uh, send it somewhere instantaneously at very low, very low cost. And the reason, I, I, the reason I, I, I like the insurance company analogy is because if you think about, people talk about the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, this is a, a Warren Buffett argument, that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, it doesn't have any earnings, it'll never pay any dividends, uh, and so, so how do you even think about something like that? It, it is a new technology, it's something that couldn't be done before, but in any case, the, the answer that I have to that is, well, I mean, what's the, what's the intrinsic value of that Mickey Mantle baseball card that sold for five and a half million dollars? It's just cardboard, and it, it doesn't even have a legend, it could be counterfeited very easily. Uh, or what's the intrinsic value of a Picasso painting, which is just canvas and paint? Uh, and uh, you know maybe a frame, but people will pay millions or tens of millions of dollars for it, and it, so it comes down at the very basic level for supply and demand. So Bitcoin is the only economic entity where um, the supply is unaffected by the demand. So even with gold, if gold, which is eighteen hundred dollars today, if gold goes to eighteen thousand dollars, there will be a lot more gold mined because mines that are unprofitable will, will become profitable. And so gold, which, which accretes today, the production of gold is about equal to about one and a half to two percent of the total value per year. And that's the same uh, accretion that Bitcoin has currently. Uh, that, but this year, 2022, I think will drop below 1.5 percent on that. So only, only 21 million Bitcoin can ever be created or close to it. It doesn't matter if Bitcoin is 100,000 or, or 20 million, there's only going to be that many of them. So. Um, th all you have to really believe is that the demand for Bitcoin will grow faster than one and a half percent, you know, over the next number of years, and the price inexorably will go up. So I've, I've, I've only recently been allowing myself to be described as a Bitcoin bull. I, I used to tell people, they say, oh, you're a Bitcoin bull, you, you own a lot of Bitcoin. I'm like, I do own a lot of it, but I'm actually a Bitcoin observer, and I'm observing its trajectory as a new technology and comparing it to the trajectories of things like uh, the printing press, or the steam engine, or the railroads, or the automobile, or electricity, and, and it's following that very, uh, uh, not, not predictable, because it's not predictable certainly in the early, early days, a well understood path for the adoption of new technologies. And you know, Stan, I think it was Stan Druckenmiller uh, said earlier in the year that, and, and, and now he owns Bitcoin by the way, um, but he said that Bitcoin was a solution in search of a problem. And w what I've found amusing about that is every new technology is, so is a solution in, in search of a problem. Because you, you have a new technology, then you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with it. And so, you know, when, you, when we created the Internet, what are we going to do with that? So uh, the Defense Department had, had use, good uses for it, but it was tough for other, other people to see. And, but now everybody can see what the value of the Internet is. Same mm -hmm. thing with the internal combustion engine, which was very dangerous and all, but now that's taken over the world, and now we're going to move to, to electricity. So uh, all kinds of technologies have to grow into their, uh, grow into their potential. And Bitcoin is, I guess if you want the theoretical answer to the question, is that's the work of Brian Arthur, Santa Fe Institute, and, and Stanford, who is kind of the leading authority on what, what he calls increasing returns economics and what he calls lock-in and path dependence in the economy. So his basic idea is that when technologies reach a certain dominance, and they're the, they're the leader, it's almost impossible to dislodge them, even without a very superior technology. And Bitcoin's there? Is that what? That's, that's, what, that's what I would say I and the other bulls believe. Okay. But why the outsized, why 50% of your personal net worth? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you're, the other 50% is in like middle value funds, or I, I don't know how you've diversified. And well, actually, actually, close to the other 50% is in Amazon. All okay. of the rest of the investments that I have are, are, ba are basically there to support margin debt. Because I always, I'm, I'm typically always on margin, which means I can take a lot of volatility. Now I'm not obviously on uh, deadly margin. I'm on the, using regular reg T margin, and I've got a fair amount of margin capacity. But the rest of the, all the stocks could eliminate all the margin debt and have a fair amount left over. And then I'd have those, those, if I had to sell all those to pay off the debt, then still have Bitcoin and Amazon.
Bill, can you explain to me the concept of Bitcoin as an insurance policy? There's 21 million shares of this insurance company outstanding. And every day that somebody wakes up and says, you know, I, I need some insurance in case something, you know, in, in case the government seizes all the gold like they did back in 1933. Or, in, you know, when, when Afghanistan, we pulled out of Afghanistan, um, Western Union stopped remittances. So if, if, you, if you couldn't get money, uh, and it's still hard to get money in Afghanistan, uh, you were in d serious trouble. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, the lira has completely collapsed. Venezuela is a failed state, and yet Bitcoin uh, continues right along. That was your insurance policy against financial catastrophe of one sort or another. And what did the Fed do when the pandemic shut down all parts of, uh, or threatened to shut down all parts of the economy? The, the financial markets came unglued, and the normal relationships between uh, uh, cash and bonds and securities, especially asset-backed securities, got blown apart. And the Fed had to increase the money supply by 25% to keep those things from collapsing as they did in 2008. Right. During that time, the Bitcoin network functioned perfectly. There was no run on it. There was, you know, prices went down initially until people figured out, wait a minute, we've had a tr tremendous collapse here and the Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain is functioning w without, a, without, a, without any interference at all. So I think that, that explains it, I think, in a way that many people can understand if you want a little bit of financial insurance, then you know, buy a Bitcoin or, or a part of a Bitcoin. The argument I get most often is, why not gold? Right, which is considered to be an insurance policy against catastrophe historically. So the, an the answer to that is, um, in my opinion anyway, uh, gold has gone from, effect it's been around 5,000 years, so it's gone from, let's call it, make up a number and say a, a dime, a nickel, mm -hmm. in today's uh, parlance. And in 5,000 years, it's gone from a nickel to $1,850. And in 10 years, Bitcoin has gone from a nickel to $57,000. So why would I own gold? Especially since gold in the last 10 years has gone down. In the last 10 years, Bitcoin is the best performing asset category in the world. So you recently marked 40 years in the investment business. And you know how, have, how has the investment business changed as far as your approach is concerned? And how have you changed? How have you evolved over the last 40 years? The investment business is, of course, radically different from what it was 40, 40 years ago when I got, got involved in it. That one major difference is interest rates at that point in time were the, in the United States were the highest in U.S. history. And now they're not just the, high, the lowest in U.S. history or close to it, but for most countries in the world, the lowest in 5,000 years. So complete radical transformation of the fixed income markets. Uh, in 1982, when we started our, when I was at Lake Mason, we started our mutual fund, the Value Trust. The amount of money, and I'm going from memory here, the amount of money in actively managed mutual funds in the entire country was around $70 billion. And at the peak of our assets in the, in the Value Trust and, and Cognate institutional accounts, we had $78 billion. So more money than was in the industry at all when I got, when I got into it. Um, and, but what, what hasn't changed is that, that human nature hasn't changed, fear and greed haven't changed. And most importantly, we understand a lot more than we used to through the workings of uh, social psychologists and behavioral finance theorists, how large numbers of people behave under certain circumstances, well-defined circumstances. And one of the things that we know, and it's been proven over and over again, uh, is that the coefficient of loss to gain is two to one. So a dollar's worth of loss in the market is twice as painful as a dollar's worth of gain is pleasurable. And as Warren Buffett often says, uh, fear is contagious and spreads rapidly, and confidence only returns slowly one person at a time. But what that means is when you have very dramatic negative events, that people tend to overreact to them, and that those are, you know, they're rare, but they're perfect buying opportunities. But I think those, those are the principles that can be, that aren't going to be changing, and that's why you can read Jesse Livermore's Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, or the Ben Graham's The Intelligent Investor, and, and profit from it, even though the markets are, are very, very different from when, when those books were published.